Uh, welcome everybody to our, I don't know how many of these we've had, our, our August Paul's faculty seminar. Today uh, we'll have at the beginning, we have Dr. Fred McIntosh from Rice, and then we have Dr. Pratush Tiwari, I don't know if I said that right, but um, from Maryland, sorry if I messed that up. And um, we are encouraged, so after the talks, we have a, a block of time for questions, and we would like students to ask the questions before faculty members do. So students, please, as you listen, think of a question. Um, you may unmute yourselves and ask the questions directly at the end, or if you put them in the chat, um, I'll try and keep an eye on that and we can ask the questions that way. So without any further ado, Dr. McIntosh. Okay, I will start sharing again as soon as I can find the right app to share. Oh. Oh yeah, here we go. Is that coming through? Yep, that's good. Okay, well, um, thank you. Uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, well, stress relaxation and uh, how it can be modified and controlled, uh, if you like, in, uh, and, and the implication is gonna ultimately be through active mechanisms. Uh, in the cytoskeleton. So the stress management in the title is not, you know, the usual uh, connection between those two words, but, uh, but indeed I want to argue that uh, there's, there are simple basic physical mechanisms whereby uh, the control of essentially fluidization um, and suppression of that uh, uh, can actually happen through um, stress generation, such as by myosin in the actin cytoskeleton. Okay, so the basic story here is a highly simplified version, pretty physics-y, I admit, uh, but it's motivated by some uh, specific uh, experiments, many, many experiments on, on cells going back about 20 years now that, that started us thinking off along these lines. Um, but the actual story I'm gonna tell you is a simplified ver version Hence, I'm going to be going through the basic physical arguments, not the calculation, um, which was actually uh, the work of Sihan Chen and Tomer Markovich. Uh, Sihan is a student of mine from the physics department here at Rice. Tomer is a uh, postdoc uh, in the center. Um, and uh, this work was itself motivated by a slightly earlier collaboration with my experimental colleagues published about a year ago. Heisi uh, Kundrink and her student at the time, uh, Yuval Mula. Um, at that time in Amsterdam, um, we've had many collaborations with Heisi over the years. She's recently moved to Delft, uh, and we have ongoing collaborations along these, along these lines. So um, here's the basic idea. Um, so uh, let me start by just talking about um, stress relaxation in a, um, in a typical polymer solution, um, or actually the response to a, a stress in this case on the left. Um, you know, I would normally expect a material to start to deform on some maybe small time scale, depending on some dynamics, which aren't gonna be so interesting for this process, um, at which point if it's elastic, the deformation will stop and become time independent. Um, equivalently, well, so, so if uh, the system is not elastic, that is, um, then beyond some relaxation time, typically the system would, would fluidize. Uh, this is obviously a passive uh, um, system. Fluidize whereby deformation would typically grow linearly in time with a constant applied stress if it is indeed Maxwellian um, in its uh, response. And that would actually be pretty typical of a lot of polymer solutions, uh, biopolymers included, um, uh, specific dependence um, uh, on various parameters can be different between uh, biopolymers, uh, semi-flexible biopolymers and flexible polymers. That's not so important for this story. Um, if instead one looks at the 
um, frequency dependence of the shear modulus, and it's going to be the shear modulus basically because these systems are solutions. So typically, one doesn't change any volumes, so the shear modulus is is the relevant quantity. Um, then you know, basically flipping both axes to get rather than deformation resistance to deformation, and rather than time frequency. Um, what you typically find, uh, hopefully, you can see my pointer. Okay, hope so. Um, you would find this long relaxation time regime here would appear as a low frequency regime in which the shear modules would vanish at low frequencies. Um, that would be a uh, fluid liquid like response. And then at intermediate frequencies, they'll, uh, they'll typically be a um, frequency independent, or not perfectly frequency independent, but nearly frequency independent elastic response. Um, again, this would be typical of a um, polymer um, system. At high frequencies, maybe some other relaxation processes uh, come into play. Uh, and then this, uh, con this uh, flat value in the middle is usually referred to as the plateau modulus. This is all linear um, viscoelastic um, behavior so far. So here's the kind of experiments that made a lot of people puzzled going back about a little under 20 years ago. So it's a paper by Ben Fabry um, and, and um, co-workers. Um, uh, where they actually showed by measurements I don't really want to get into. Um, uh, long story, um, uh, debatable in points, but basically this has been borne out by many subsequent experiments. What they showed is a surprising result um, if you think about a polymer, um, a polymer rheology of the kind I showed before, rather than a plateau, um, a very weak frequency dependence. Uh, so weak, uh, they actually uh, argued that it was actually a power law regime um, with a frequency dependent, uh, uh, sorry, an exponent of frequency here, which was in the 0.1 to 0.3 range. Um, and uh, that was actually observed in a number of experiments, in various experimental conditions here. Um, this was actually twisting cytometry, so called, uh, putting a bead, attaching a bead to a cell and wiggling it. Again, it's been borne out by other experiments, same basic idea. And the puzzling thing is um, this, frequent, this frequency, sort of frequency dependence is unusual uh, in, uh, in any um, synthetic polymer context that, that, that I'm aware of, uh, many, many other people are aware of, uh, at least for like a solution. Um, so um, what's going on here? Well, I actually want to argue that, um, so, so those authors, maybe I should back up, those authors argued or, or used the term soft glassy rheology. The relaxation is reminiscent of, of uh, uh, glassy behavior seen in certain soft matter systems, for instance, colloidal systems and others. Um, I'm going to actually argue that you can understand this behavior in terms of um, uh, much more direct uh, polymer rheology, provided that you um, take into account the stiffness of the filaments involved, so these are going to be semi-flexible polymers, uh, together with nonlinear viscoelasticity. So that is going to be key here, I will conclude. Um, and uh, then otherwise, the other element uh, will be transient cross-linking. Transient cross-linkers, which are not fully permanent, uh, are generic in the cytoskeleton. Okay, so um, here's the basic idea. So I'm drawing a, a little sketch of a uh, initially blue polymer cross-linked into some matrix at these points in a black. And um, so um, naively, uh, that means that these points shown as black dots are constrained and the only remaining fluctuations open or available to this polymer are lateral fluctuations between cross-links. Um, and so those will uh, typically fluctuate laterally by an amount delta u. And um, one can estimate that simple scaling argument. I won't go through in detail, but basically dimensional analysis arguments would suggest that it goes inversely in the stiffness of the polymer. That's characterized by what's called a persistence length, the length over which the polymer would appear straight in the presence of thermal fluctuations. And then dimensionally, there should just be three other factors of length. And if you put in all the prefactors, you can do a real calculation. But basically, this length is just the distance between these cross lengths. OK. Now, that's not what someone can, that's not what one can measure in directly in the rheology, however. What one measures in the rheology is the longitudinal resistance of this polymer strand to stretching. 
So what I need to worry about instead is the longitudinal fluctuations. Uh, and at least in an, in an, if there's equilibrium thermal fluctuations, those fluctuations will give me an elasticity, entropic-like elasticity. So the thing to note is that this longi these longitudinal fluctuations are fundamentally nonlinear in the transverse fluctuations because basically um, I, as I, if, I, if I deflect the polymer, hopefully you can see my polymer here, um, if I deflect that in one direction or the other, I get the same longitudinal response. So it appeared the, these longitudinal fluctuations are quadratic and these transverse fluctuations go through some simple arguments and there's a quad quadratic dependence on persistence length and then dimensional arguments would tell you there's four factors of length. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the entropic-like response of this thought of as a spring would go as, uh, the spring constant would go as four inverse powers since the, this is the compliance, so this will go inverse in the spring constant. The, com the uh, spring constant would go as one over the length to the fourth power. Now turning that into a, a modulus rather than a, um, rather than a spring constant, uh, that, act that actually gives me three powers of the length, the relevant length scale, the distance between cross lengths that would appear in the shear modulus here. And this, base, this simple picture of elasticity of semi-flexible polymers has been reasonably well borne out by a range of systems, including actin and others. Okay, what about dynamics? So, um, uh, well, um, the other thing to note is that these fluctuations, these transverse fluctuations have a dispersion relation, um, which again, dimensional arguments would suggest go proportional to the bending rigidity of the fiber, that's kappa. They should go inverse in the viscosity of the solvent, that's eta. And then dimensionally, there has to be four factors of length or four factors of Q. And so actually a proper calculation will show you that the rate of relaxation as a function of wavelength is indeed inverse in with four powers of the wavelength or goes as Q to the four, the wave vector. So I could turn this around and say there's a characteristic length scale corresponding to the transverse fluctuations, the wavelength of the transverse fluctuations that can relax on a given time scale. And that goes as T to the one quarter. So that's a, a, a starting point here. By the way, um, uh, I shouldn't dwell on this too much, but if you just plug this length here back up into this expression down here, you'll find that the high frequency response of these polymer, uh, these semi-flexible polymer gels would actually sh show a three quarters power law with frequency well observed in experiments. Okay, so far so good. Transient crosslinking. Now, what happens with transient cross-linking? Well, you might have guessed that the transient cross-linkers just slows down the transverse fluctuations, and ultimately I'll still get a Maxwellian-like response. The system will fluidize. What's actually been observed, and I'll show you some experiments in a moment, is that rather than going into a Maxwell-like regime, they show a non-trivial viscoelastic response. And so let me give you the argument for that. And I'm, again, highlighting just the very simplest physical aspects of the, of the picture. So the first thing to note is that in order to relax a transverse wavelength, transverse fluctuation of this polymer um, on lengths, on, on, with wavelengths longer than the distance between cross lengths, initial cross lengths, I have to wait for the cross lengths to unbind. Moreover, to relax a long wavelength, I have to wait for many of those unbinding events. So those transverse fluctuations can sort of add up to a longer wavelength. What that actually means is that in the hydrodynamic limit, Q goes to zero, a long wavelength, the effective mobility or viscosity actually vanishes. It's zero. The, these, these, the, the mobility slows down with wavelength, um, and so there isn't an effective long wavelength viscosity. And then, and then a very simple argument, which can be backed up by a proper calculation, suggests that if you just look at the Q-dependent mobility, the next term should be, if the Q to the zero term is gone, the next term should be Q squared. And so the argument is that that term actually then gives us a characteristic length for the transverse wavelengths that can relax with this transient binding, corresponding to wavelengths longer than the, the distance between cross lengths which actually goes as t to the one sixth. 
Again, notice it's slowing down anomalously so at long times. That's the suppression of long wavelength um, mobility um, due to the transient cross-linking. Prefactors depend on the off rate, so that's why I'm not including prefactors. <clears throat> okay, so now how does that work? Well, let me plug that in back into my same old expression. I'm going to keep using this over and over again. Um, plug it back into the same old expression, and it would suggest that there would be a frequency to the one half regime for the shear modulus. And sure enough, that's what appears at low wavelengths. So this is below the plateau modulus. This is, um, sorry, long time scales or low uh, frequencies. Um, and here's actual experiments to show you that. So this is actually a plot uh, showing both experiment and a mean field theory we developed a few years ago for this transient regime, shown as the solid lines. But what's important is this one half regime shown here. Um, and the experiments, um, I'm gonna gloss over the details, but let me just um, point out, these are reconstituted actin, cross-linked uh, actin um, systems where the cross-linker was alpha actinin, a physiological cross-linker with uh, known transient uh, behavior. Now what's interesting about this is that this long time or low frequency regime is not at all Maxwellian. You might have guessed that after that below the plateau, time scales longer than uh, time scales when the relaxation starts to occur, the system would go Maxwellian. It does not. It actually has orders of magnitude and frequency of this one half regime. Okay, so I'm going to claim that if we, I hope to convince you that if we just put this physics together with one new missing ingredient, the nonlinear elastic properties, we can get those anomalously weak frequency dependencies. Okay, so I need to tell you about nonlinear elasticity, elasticity now. Um, so, um, well, again, this, you can do this in terms of a length scale. There's another length scale in the problem. So if the polymer fluctuations are controlled by two quantities, the bending resistance of the fiber, and now also the tension put in the fiber, that tends to stretch the polymer out, of course, then the ratio of those two things, take, and if I take the square root, I get a length, a natural length scale, which I can think of as a tension length, length scale, has the following physical interpretation. For wavelengths longer than that length scale, the um, conformation of the polymer is entirely dominated by the tension, meaning that it's stretched out. And only for wavelengths shorter than that will the fluctuations be controlled by the bending rigidity and those thermal fluctuations I was talking about before that give the entropic response. That's, you know, simplifying a more complicated picture, but let's see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in this tension length into my familiar formula here with the inverse three powers of of length, and I get a stiffness of the network. This is no longer a shear modulus. It has to be the derivative of stress and strain because it's nonlinear. So it's the incremental stiffness to additional deformation. Um, and that uh, should go as tension to the 3 halves power, which of course also is proportional to the applied stress to the system to the 3 halves power. And this is now well established and observed in many experiments. This is actually going back to 15-year-old experiments uh, in an earlier collaboration with Margaret Cardell. Whoops. Um, and uh, so that's the other known physics I want to add into the problem. Okay. Now, first thing to note is that in addition to this nonlinear behavior, there's a natural stress scale or force scale at which the system would become nonlinear. And that's basically where this tension length which starts off at low tension to be very long, that's where that, and that's where the system would behave in a linear elastic uh, way. When that length scale with increasing tension becomes small enough to be comparable to the distance between cross lengths, the network response should be nonlinear. So that actually means that there's a stress scale that goes as two powers of this characteristic length, the cross length distance. If I plug in my transient length from the previous transparency, notice I get a stress threshold at which this nonlinearity should kick in, which goes as omega to the one, one third power. Sure enough, that's what's observed. It's not an exact one third, but it's pretty consistent. 
So this is from experiments now by um, my colleagues, again, back in Amsterdam and now Delft. This is a similar um, uh, reconstituted actin plus alpha actinin um, system. Okay, so um, one, can, can, one can do better than this. So um, let me just try to summarize the, the uh, results that one gets out of a more complete theory, which of course I'm glossing over. And I wanna do this in terms of a regime diagram. So I'm gonna plot um, two lengths. So this is this transient length. That's the wavelength that can relax with transient dynamics. So obviously transient behavior only appears when that length becomes longer than the cross length distance when I'm actually relaxing those longer wavelength modes. And then my tension length. Um, now this, if I move vertically on this diagram, I'm actually reducing stress. So stress increases as I go down this axis, time increases to the right on this axis, or frequency increases to the left on this axis. Okay, if I draw a dashed line, I'll separate the transient regime on the right from the permanently cross-linked network regime on the left adding in the nonlinear effects at high stress down here, I get a non, the nonlinear response I was just telling you about. Notice no frequency dependence. This is, no, this is a permanent network. And a linear elastic regime down here. I mean, up here, but at low stress. Okay, what about the transient regimes? Well, up here in this little wedge um, is the transient regime I showed you before, based on that simple argument. And now what happens down here is um, I get uh, the stiffness, which is fundamentally nonlinear, I wanna argue, um, which, uh, in which the uh, modulus increases with a very weak power uh, less than one half. So let me just quickly show you the results on this. So plotted on the right here are these experiments that I mentioned. This is plotting stiffness versus stress at different frequencies. Frequency is shown by the color here. Um, so high frequency or short time is blue, long time, low frequency is green. Um, and then this is plotted versus stress. But let me not dwell on these data. Let me just point out, I, I, I suggested before that there's a characteristic stress scale, which goes as frequency to the one third power. Let me scale this axis by that and scale the stiffness by the corresponding frequency dependence. And what happens is all those data, this is the same data, they all collapse onto a common behavior here, which is consistent with the result of a microscopic theory, the details of which I'm not giving you. That's shown in purple. Uh, obviously, the overall scale factors in the two axes are changed, but this is a log-log scale, so this is showing you that the, you get consistent um, functional dependence. So that's the nonlinear behavior. Um, what about the frequency dependence? Well, so this is actually showing the frequency dependence. So the horizontal axis now is frequency um, versus, and I'm plotting on, on the vertical axis, the stiffness of the network. Um, this is all in the transient regime, as it turns out. These experiments actually had a off rate uh, for the alpha tenon, which was about a tenth of a second. So that's why uh, the experiments don't really go into a plateau modulus regime. So all these experiments here are in this regime here. Um, but basically what happens is you can understand in the following simple way. Okay, um, notice that uh, if I change frequency or time, I move across this boundary like this. I go from a linear regime to a nonlinear regime as I go to longer times or lower frequencies. The reason is, at those longer times, I have longer wavelength relaxation. That means the stress threshold to go nonlinear is lower. So the system is not as more, well, so um, at low stress, if you like, I see this one half regime I showed you before. And particularly on long time scales or low frequencies, the system is highly responsive to stress. So that's why these data lift up here. Um, and what ultimately gives the weaker dependence. Now the actual, uh, this, is, this is actually a simultaneous fit of a family of curves with just uh, a common set of parameters. It's the more microscopic theory uh, by Sihan and Tomer that I'm not um, giving you the details of. 
Um, so these are, these are not individual fits. It's a family of curves fit simultaneously with the same parameters. Um, what in detail actually this, these, what we're concluding is that these are not true power law regimes. You'll notice some dependence here, which is non-trivial. However, one does a, 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 you know, over a limited frequency range of a decade or so, one can extract an apparent exponent, um, which is shown, the experiments are shown here in the symbols and the blue is the full um, theory. So we get good agreement again um, for that, um, this transient behavior. The implication again is that one can understand this, these anomalously weak frequency dependences relative to normal polymer rheology, if you like, of uh, the cell um, uh, rheology um, in terms of just two, putting together two known uh, physical effects, the nonlinear response of semi-flexible networks such as actin together with transient cross-linking. Um, there's some interesting implications here, of course. Um, let me just wrap up with these. Um, obviously, one implication is that and I think I even hinted this already, um, if this is stress, which is controlling the, the apparent exponent here, that's what I just showed you, and weakening that, that dependence, um, again, maybe backing up to the previous plot, notice that as you add stress, the system is looking more solidly. So it's a sort of suppression of fluidization. Um, can that be controlled by, for instance, myosin activity? Uh, obviously, this is an actin network that I'm talking about. This, these simplified reconstituted systems I showed you didn't have actin. That's, you know, the work of uh, an ongoing collaboration, but certainly an implication. It's a little hard to directly look at stress inside a cell. Um, the, if you, it, it, so it, the answer to the question, can myosin activity give you the kinds of exponents that have been shown in experiments together with the dependence of those exponents? The answer is yes and no. Um, there are experiments that uh, are consistent with myosin generated stress controlling that exponent. There are other experiments that are inconsistent with that. And the primary effect there is probably another active process, which is the remodeling of the network. So the myosin is also driving um, uh, remodeling of those networks. So you can also get fluidization by myosin. Um, another interesting thing to think about is catch bond effects. I just went through an argument that says, in essence, the system is more solid like at high stress. Well, what happens if I have catch bond effect in these crosslinks? At high stress, I'll suppress the off uh, rate of um, or the, the unbinding, if you like, also potentially sol uh, solidifying the system or rigidifying it. Now that is something that I haven't shown the experiments on, but that is something we observed about five years ago in a, in a prior collaboration in the linear response regime, again with the Dave Waits group um, uh, that I mentioned before. So you can get also a stress enhanced gelation due to catch bond effects. Um, another interesting question to ask is what about other transient effects in other networks? We're actually exploring this right now in an uh, ongoing collaboration with uh, Heise Kunderink uh, in uh, hyaluronic acid um, systems, as it turns out. Okay, anyway, um, hope that at least suggests that basic physical arguments of nonlinearity together com coming from stress generation, potentially by myosin, together with known transient cross-linking behavior can give rise to this glassy-like response that people have observed in experiments. Questions? I think now I, sh I think I should be wrapping up, ooh, I guess maybe five minutes ago. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> okay. Questions? Do we have students with questions? Uh, can I just ask one fast question here since people are not asking? Uh, yeah. You have two effects. You have this non transient net change and you have this stress related. Are they correlated? Are these two independent things? How do we connect with experiments here? That's what I'm I trying to get, I didn't get the second one. The, the second one is the stress by the. the yeah. yeah. So, so basically, if you take 
Um, well, so for instance, these same experiments that I was showing you that give the frequency, the weak frequency dependence, do indeed show, so I didn't actually plot it here, but this uh, asymptotic behavior up here is consistent with that three halves scaling of stress that I showed you before. So I would say these, these networks are certainly consistent with that previously identified nonlinear effect. Um, and then if you go to the frequency dependence at low stress, this is actually consistent with those, with that both model and prior experiments in the linear viscoelastic regime with the one half dependence. But how about these nonlinear connections that you said, these frequency dependent nonlinear? Yeah, so, so here's the nonlinearity. As I add stress, the system obviously becomes nonlinear because no longer is the system independent of stress. Um, and uh, that actually gives you these, uh, these weak frequency dependencies. So there have been experiments, I should point out, where people have taken cell, done the same kind of experiment on cells that they put on, that they stretched basically and applied external stress to. It's a bit of a messy experiment to, um, to interpret, but those also seem to have a weaker time dependence or frequency dependence as you apply that stress. So that does seem to account for those experiments. So you're telling me the frequency dependence has to come from these nonlinear connections breaking, not from the stress. It's the combination of the nonlinearity and the, and the transient cross-linking. Turn off either one and you'll lose this. Okay. Are there other questions? So, uh, Herbie, I mean, perhaps you feel like speculating a bit on, you know, how much of this is really, you know, helping biology do what it wants to do with the cytoskeleton in a real cell. Uh, I mean, I understand that's not the, what you were talking about per se, but I'm just trying to understand how, you know, these different elements of controlling the, the uh, viscoelasticity or whatever might come into actual functional uh, roles that various uh, modulators could play inside a cell. I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Well, so certainly one of the implications, and again, this is consistent with some experiments, although it gets a little murky, I admit. Um, the implication is, notice these are log-log plots. Notice the uh, two or, nearly two order of magnitude increase in not just the stiffness of these networks with stress. So again, the color coding is stress. Um, so by, by increasing the level of stress by notice less than a decade here, well, I guess the very lowest experiments are, are, are lower than that. So um, you're getting this substantial increase in stiffness, but perhaps more interestingly, it's looking more solid-like. So you could certainly ima imagine a situation where not only, I mean, nonlinearity has been discussed in this context with actomyosin before, of course, right? Um, stiffening cells with internal stress generation is something right. a number of people have looked at. This is also saying, though, that um, that increased stress actually changes the character of the system from a more fluid-like behavior to a more solid-like behavior. And I think that certainly could be important for, um, you know, mechanical stability, uh, will affect uh, migration, presumably. Okay. Thanks. Um, do we have a student question? Come on, guys. Okay, here's, while you're thinking, I have a quick poll for y'all about how you heard about this meeting. Was it from the Paul's email or was it from the world, this new, the worldwide web website or other? So I'm going to launch this. So you can answer the question. Um, can you if, put Twitter on the poll? Oh, sure. That could be other. Okay. Is that, or here, I'll put that on real quick. Oh, it's not, it's going to be complicated. <laughs> if, if you heard about it through, through uh, Twitter, you could put that in the chat. 
um, and put other in the poll. It would just be. Oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Good to hear how y'all heard about the meeting. All right, is there a student question? All right, then Arpita, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So yeah, hoping um, students um, will get more engaged. I know it's hot in this virtual setting sometimes, but I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Pratush Tiwari. He's at University of Maryland College Park. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry and joined Maryland in 2017. His PhD was at Caltech and then a postdoc at Columbia University. So Pratish has been working on various things, uh, for example, algorithms for sampling rare events um, in computational protein structure and dynamics, but he'll be talking to us, I think, about more recent work uh, done on applying machine learning and AI approaches to molecular dynamics. So I'm really happy to um, hear his talk. Okay. Thank you, Arpita. Can you see my screen? Yes. And, and you can hear me, I imagine. Okay, great. Perfect. So thank you very much for inviting me to uh, Arpita and to Margie. And I have heard many things about this network uh, over the years. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be talking here with you. So uh, as Arpita mentioned, I am at the University of Maryland I've been here for a little over three years in the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and jointly appointed in a very unique institute called IPST, and, uh, which uh, allows me to do a lot of interdisciplinary research and have a lot of fun. So today, it's, it's 5 p.m. on the East Coast, and uh, I was worried that some of you might leave before this talk is over. So I decided I will do something non-traditional. Uh, I'm going to answer the question posed in the title of this talk at the very beginning. So the answer is yes. It can, it can definitely learn molecular dynamics. It can probably also predict biomolecular dynamics. However, as I will try to show you in the remaining part of this presentation, it's not very smart. It's not very intelligent, as, as one might put it. And coupling with statistical mechanics is really the approach we are taking in my lab in order to guide its way and make it a bit smarter. And then I will show you a variety of examples uh, depending on time. And uh, all these codes are available at github.com slash Tiwari lab. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. So my lab is made up of students from various departments. We have two very hardworking undergraduates, Pavan especially, who is going to be applying to graduate school this year. So, uh, and I will be showing, I think, some of his work. And Rory, who just left us to move go to Max Planck Florida Institute in Neuroscience. And uh, we have graduate students from a variety of departments, biophysics, physics, uh, chemistry, and also applied math, given the nature of what we do. Uh, we have some uh, collaborators uh, who we have very active collaborations going on with. And these days, since it's working from home, it's really my dog who seems to be like, physically close to me, well, apart from my wife. But I don't think I should show her picture here. And he, you might see my dog come through the middle of the talk. He's just going out for a walk. So, and we are funded by a variety of sources uh, from Petroleum Research Fund to Department of Energy and uh, NCI UMD Partnership for Cancer Research and also uh, Schrodinger, the drug design company. And we are very heavy in supercomputer usage. So we try to use computer time wherever we can get hold of it. So the big picture of what motivates us is this notion that well, living systems move, living systems fluctuate. If something is not moving, something is not fluctuating, it's probably dead. And this movement can be very complicated. It can be, as you saw in the previous talk, it can have many, many components at different frequencies. It can be hard to predict. One of the systems we will be looking at today, it's a, a very popular workhorse for us. It's called the T4 lysozyme system, where you can see just by introducing simple point mutations. So this is a single mutant, this is a double mutant, and this is a triple mutant. So if you don't have a single mutant, it's a really boring system, but it's important in the human body, but for us, it's kind of boring. When you make the simple single mutant, it becomes important because suddenly a hydrophobic cavity opens up. So for the single mutant, you have a population of ground state and excited state in 97 to 3%. And as you start to increase mutations, the population completely flips. This was first predicted by David Baker and then validated in experiments. And we would like to predict these things and understand why, these, why this happens. And it's not just in proteins. We are also very much interested in nucleic acids. Uh, 
we would like to design drugs that can go and bind to RNA eventually, but nucleic acid reflexibility takes on uh, 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 even higher order of magnitude. In fact, the PDB has, I think around 200,000 structures, if not many more, for proteins bound with ligands, but for RNA, for synthetic ligands, it's less than 100 reported structures. So, and, uh, so we would like to do things like this, and there are many other applications that we are interested in, but the long story short, we would like to study proteins and nucleic acids and whatever else we can get our hands on by using molecular dynamics, which is solving Newton's law of motion. So the idea is quite simple. You have F is equal to MA that you're solving with a time step of femtosecond. With supercomputers such as the University of Maryland's Deep Thought 2, you can get to a microsecond for maybe a 100,000 atom system, explicit water over a couple of weeks, which is very impressive. And uh, then people realized that hardware that was being developed to keep undergraduates from getting bored by playing all these engaging video games such as Call of Duty, you know, these GPUs were started being put to better use and GPUs also made the things, uh, made MD much faster. Then a very rich person got involved in the problem, uh, David Shaw, who designed a very, very specific computer just for doing molecular dynamics called Anton, with which they were able to push to a millisecond for the first time in uh, around uh, 2008 or so. So with this, we, we can indeed study a lot of conformational change on Anton, and, uh, but there are a lot of problems that we are interested in, such as protein ligand binding or unbinding or nucleation of a crystal, which are so slow that brute force MD with just hard code computing advances is probably not going to get there. And even if it does, this is all with classical force fields. One day I might want to use polarizable force fields, which are even slower, or I might want to go out into born oppenheimer or car Parinello type approximations where I start to treat the uh, quantum level effects. And then maybe I want to just do fully quantum dynamics. Why not? It, uh, we have water everywhere and there's uh, hydrogen atoms. So, so this time scale problem will always be there. And uh, it's infuriatingly, infuriatingly hard to solve, unlike space. So we can do billion atom MD. It's hard to just do a one second long MD simulation by just patching computers together, even though Markov state models and all have tried to do that and succeeded to a large, uh, to a fair extent. Because time is sequential. You need to know the past in order to predict the future. So th the name of the game in tackling this problem has been this uh, concept of enhanced sampling, where the idea is that if you could somehow get a sense for the approximate reaction coordinate of the system, then you could, instead of the system being just trapped in one basin, you could start, for example, doing something like metadynamics, which goes in many other names, or umbrella sampling, or whatever you wish, and you can sample the relative probability distributions of two basins even if in molecular dynamics you would have been trapped, you would have never visited the other basin. Now you could start, if you knew the correct degrees of freedom, and I keep emphasizing this if, because that's the crux of today's talk, how do we figure it out? If you knew this correct degree of freedom, you could add this bias and you could go back and forth. And similar ideas apply in umbrella sampling and a lot of other methods. The interesting thing though, is it doesn't have to be the perfect reaction coordinate, which is known as, for example, the isochometer, very, crude approximations also seem to get the job done in these sampling methods. Yet, in high dimensional system, reducing it to low dimensionalities where anything that is orthogonal to this on this line you can imagine projecting out of this page should be fast and that's, that's hard. So this applies, like I said, to a variety of enhanced sampling problems, uh, simulation, sorry, enhanced sampling simulation methods. And uh, the traditional approach in enhanced sampling has been you are interested in the problem, you kind of approximate your reaction coordinate, you do your free energy simulation, and if you're feeling brave enough, you go and do kinetics. In fact, uh, uh, I, I actually did uh, two postdocs. One was at Columbia with Bruce Bourne, and before that I was a postdoc with Michele Parnello in Switzerland. And one of the things we did there is that if your coordinate is good enough, you can not just get the static free energy from metadynamics, you can go and use some Arthur Water style hyperdynamics type ideas and even calculate the time constants, the rate constants for the process at hand. And we showed if how to check a posteriori that the reaction coordinate is not good, but we could not guide as to how to figure out the reaction coordinate 
at the beginning. And that is the chicken versus egg problem at the heart of sampling. And this is not just multidynamics, this is at the heart of all important sampling. Basically, you need to know the answer if you want to know the answer. So to, in order to perform sampling, you need to know this low dimensional representation, which is capturing all these low degrees of freedom. How do you find it if you haven't sampled the system in the first place? So we would like to learn sampling methods, develop sampling methods that learn the RC as they, learn the, as they explore the landscape or learn the landscape in rare event systems. And I must point out that a lot of work in this direction has been done by uh, Cecilia Clementi. She has methods such as diffusion map MD and also Cecilia and uh, Yanis Kevrikedes and Gerhard Hammer are really some of the pioneers in this field. And uh, so I'm not the only one working on this, but none of those methods have really replaced MD yet. So which shows to me that there is a scope for a lot of practical method development in this field. So we thought for a variety of reasons, let's say what we can do with AI. So actually at this point, I will shift to uh, automatic, let's see if that works. So you see these three faces here. So my cousins back home in India want to play, like to play this game where they upload their picture and a picture of some girl they like very much. And the website is going to tell them if you married this girl, how would your, if you had a kid with this girl, how would your baby look like, right? So how do you do that? Can you just take the arithmetic mean of two pictures and would it look like a human? The answer is no, right? It would look like a potato or an onion or something like that. So in order to really average features from two faces, you have to kind of figure out, that, oh, maybe there is something like a smile, something like hair, something like nose. These are abstract concepts that we take for granted, but what has happened in the field of machine learning and AI is that you can train a deep neural network to kind of get a sense of these abstract concepts. So here on the right, I am showing you training on people's handwriting digits where, you know, we all think our handwriting is this beautiful, unique thing, but well, you can take a sample set coming from lots of people's handwriting and you can cluster it into a two dimensional space. That's it you can have two variables and it's another question, what are these two variables, right? Maybe one of these corresponds to using cursive versus using non-cursive. Interpreting this variable is a different question, but you can do this. You can cluster all every a, a collection of handwritten digits into a model where you can just pick out which digit is which. So the motivation that I had in my research group when I started at Maryland was, could we use these late, so-called latent variables learned from a deep neural network? So here, this is called an encoder because you're taking a high dimensional input and preparing a low dimensional code out of it. And then during training, you use this code to, to a decoder to sample back the input that you gave to it. And you minimize the error between the input and the output, and then you can ignore the decoder and you can work with this low dimensional space that you see over here. So we wanted to use this latent variable as a reaction coordinate and enhance sampling. That was one approach. And I will tell you why this is not a garbage approach, why it makes sense to use this as a reaction coordinate. The other approach we have been taking more recently, and this work is not published, as the last work I will be talking about is was published in JCP, JCTC, and last year in Nature Communication. This one is uh, out for review, also in Nature Communication. So this one uses something called long short term memory networks. Now, if I was giving this talk in real life, I could have asked you, I would have asked you how many of you know about it. From my past experience, typically 40% of the people or 30% of the people, depending on the audience, raise their hand. But what I can say with confidence is that almost certainly 100% of you have used it today. In fact, some of you might have used it during this talk itself while you were multitasking, trying to listen to me or the previous speaker. You know, this is when you're typing an email in Gmail and it helps you fill up sentences. So here, hopefully the movie is playing for you. So you type, let's get together soon for tacos. I find this very impressive that it figures out if you bring the chips and salsa. So in this case, this happened because the Jacqueline probably tends to write about chips and salsa frequently. But what Google is using here in the Smart Compose is something called long short term memory network. So we will be using this as well. And uh, the idea here is that you are trying to fill in words, you're trying to see the structure in language and predict either at the character level or, the, or at the word level what's going to happen next. So the, our motivation was, could we think of a sequence of dihedral angles for a protein and map that into a sequence of words? So 
uh, let's say we have only one dihedral angle, it would and it can we could bin it in different values. And instead, of, if it goes from minus pi to pi, I could bin it in 26 bins, and that would be my a, b, c, d, z. It would be a funny language because a would be the same as z due to periodic boundary conditions, but we can deal with that. And uh, it could also be had emission words, but in principle, the same tools could apply if. LSTMs can be trained to predict languages and stock markets and things like that. How do they do when it comes to predicting biomarker dynamics? So let's see how, what we have done here. So first I wanna talk about this uh, autoencoder idea. So uh, in fact, I think it was two or three weeks ago that Ilya Nemanman gave a, a nice talk and some of this work was inspired by, well, a lot of this work was inspired by his work. Uh, on predictive information bottleneck along with Bill B. Alex, Susan Still and others. So information bottleneck is, and I'm, I, I want, I'm not going off in another direction. I'm just going to tell you about information bottleneck because it is a generalization of something in, which has become very popular in AI called variational autoencoders. Mm -hmm. So the concept of information bottleneck as proposed by B. Alec, but really it goes back to work by Shannon in 1940s and 50s on was it 50s? Mostly 40s on rate distortion theory. It's probably dead in early 50s. So the idea of an information bottleneck is if you have a high dimensional input and you want to design a model that allows you to predict some output, this output could also be high dimensional or it could be a set of labels. It could be some generic output. A good model should have two properties. It should be as compressive as possible. That is, it should not need to know everything about the input feature. It should be able to separate out the signal from the noise and not compute anything related to the noise terms. For example, if you have a data set and you add a bunch of white noise to the data set in different dimensions, your model should be immediately able to pick that you're trying to trick it, that this is all just noise, don't care about this. So it should be compressive. So you have one bottleneck over here, one funnel over here, and it should also be predictive. So you can compress everything into one data point, but then you will lose all predictive power, right? You won't be able to predict anything. So you reach a natural bottleneck type of structure and you can write down an objective function which involves minimizing the difference of two mutual informations. And of course, I don't have time to go into explaining to you what is mutual information. And you can email me later or look up Wikipedia uh, to learn about it. So basically it captures how much does this bottleneck know about the input. You want to minimize that. So that's why you have a positive sign here. Beta has to be more than or equal to zero and you have a negative sign over here. So if you set beta is equal to one and try to predict the input itself, you reduce to something called variational autoencoder. Fitting this objective function is, so in principle, the problem is done. All we need to do this is a functional, L can be treated as a functional of chi, given our training data set. So we will have some MD trajectory, some molecular dynamics trajectory until time T, and we will have the feature of this trajectory. And we could minimize this quantity and get our low dimensional reaction coordinate, which would capture all that is to be learned in this trajectory. In a sense, you have approximated the propagator for the system. So this optimization, however, is quite hard in practice to do this, there we use these ideas called variation inference, which is really a restatement of feynman gives bogolubov inequality. Again, I'm gonna skip how that works, but uh, you can read it in the paper. So we can minimize this objective function and we can learn the bottleneck. That's the simple idea in this method. How does it work in practice? We start with an MD trajectory. This here is a ligand dissociating from a riboswitch. If you just did MD on this, so we did, uh, we ran around uh, close to one mic, uh, uh, one microsecond of MD, if not more, on this system, and nothing happens. It just sits there, which is good news because it shows you that the force fields are probably reliable. Here we are using a very recent nucleic acid force field developed by the David Shaw group last year. But you can take this trajectory where not much happens, and you can learn the bottleneck from this trajectory. You can use this bottleneck as a reaction coordinate to do your enhanced sampling. Here I am showing you a linear encoder. The advantage to linear encoder is that I can actually interpret this reaction coordinate directly. Linear models are interpretable. I can directly tell you what weight does a particular constituent have in this. 
reaction coordinate. If we can always also move to nonlinear encoder, but then the interpretability becomes harder. We have we are working on ways how to do that. But you can take this coordinate. Now you can do your metadynamics or whatever sampling you want to do along this coordinate. And now you can generate a trajectory where the ligand actually does something. Now this ligand will probably not dissociate all the way, but maybe it will move a bit further. So you keep iterating in this picture in every round you are learning the reaction coordinate, you're using this reaction coordinate to do better sampling, and you're using this trajectory to learn a better reaction coordinate, and you converge. Convergence is tricky. So far, we mostly use as a metric if the sampling becomes more ergodic. If there is no further increase in ergodicity as a function of rounds, then we say, okay, we are done. But this is something where we are trying to figure out how to really demonstrate that this process has converged. Yet another question is, the how does uncertainty propagate through this process and every round we are making some error in the reaction coordinate we are making some error in sampling the probability distribution of the reaction coordinate how do we say how reliable is the final estimate so these are open problems that we are working on lots of open problems which is what makes the field exciting but one open problem i want to show you in which we have made some progress is is does AI really do everything? The answer is it often misleads and it misleads really frequently. For example, this is a website at Stanford where you upload a picture. So this uses something called the RNN or recurrent neural network, which is similar to LSTM. I will be showing you in a minute. You upload a picture and it generates a text corresponding to the picture. So when it works well, it works beautifully. Man in black shirt is playing guitar. Black and white dog jumps over bar. Okay. When it doesn't work well, it looks something like this. Surfboards on a beach? No. Bunch of bananas are on the table. Cat looking at pigeon? No. Group of people standing around a horse. Again, some garbage. So it can often mislead. And in, uh, in fact, this, this is work done by Shashank Pant, who is a PhD student with Imad uh, he kept He spent uh, somewhere in our group and uh, did all of this work, which is now under review at Science Advances. What Shashank found, in collaboration with my students Yihang and Zach is even for the hydrogen atom for free energy simulations, alanine dipeptide and vacuum, if you take an MD trajectory and you, and so, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that the name of our algorithm is RAVE, re-weighted auto-encoded variation base for enhanced sampling. So the full form you might forget, the acronym is easy to remember. So he did RAVE on this short, well, this long MD trajectory, is it two nanoseconds? I have to check with him. How do you get transitions? I think it must be two microseconds. Anyway, so you train on this trajectory. You have two transitions. It's a rare event, as you can see. And you stop the training, the AI training, at the same value of this objective function of the information bottleneck type thing. How different are the reaction coordinates in six different, five, six different iterations stopped at the same value? So just before I tell you the answer, I want you to imagine that this this objective function of the information bottleneck, it's a surface. It's a high dimensional surface on which you are trying to find the global minima. There are rigorous proofs. In fact, Grant Rotskoff, who is at Stanford with Eric Van den Eyden, has some nice work on this where he shows that if you have infinite training data and if you have infinitely deep neural network, this is a convex problem. You don't need to worry about anything. You always land at the minimum. We don't have infinite training data. If you had infinite training data, why would we be trying to do enhance something to begin with, right? We are trying to accelerate rare events. Furthermore, we cannot really do infinitely deep neural networks because there are practical problems in training. So this is not a convex problem. And in fact, what we find is that the same value of loss function can correspond to different values of the reaction coordinate. If you stare carefully, you will find that most of them are just mirror images of each other. But if you keep playing more and more, you will get non-trivial transformations also. And how, how do you say which one is garbage and which one is not garbage? So for this, we went back to StackMac and we introduced an idea that I uh, worked on with when I was a postdoc with Bruce Byrne at Columbia as two very interesting years, <clears throat> where we had this idea that it was actually a method for finding reaction coordinates, but it has its own approximation. So, but now we can use that method over here on top of AI solutions. And the idea is quite simple. The idea is that if you have two solutions coming two reaction coordinates that you have figured out from AI or anywhere else, in, in uh, 
in this case, green is better reaction coordinate and red is a poorer reaction coordinate, right? And if you plot the free energy along reaction coordinate one and reaction coordinate two, you'll see that the better one has a higher spectral gap. This is also the notion, the concept behind variational transition state theory. While the poorer one does not have a high spectral gap. By spectral gap, I mean in, in approximately the ratio of the populations at the barrier and in the basin. So estimating the spectral gap again, you have a chicken versus egg problem. So here we use some ideas uh, coming from E.T. Jaynes, but then popularized by uh, Ken Dill in the last few years, this notion of maximum caliber or maximum path entropy, which allows us to construct a very cheap dynamical model for moving between points A and point B, given whatever we know about the system. So this caliber is like a path entropy of a system. It's a good way to construct a cheap kinetic model. And that's what we use it here. We have some observations coming from metadynamics or from unbiased MD about the stationary probability. We also have some information about local rate constants and we can use this Actually, sorry, we don't have information about the local rate constants. We have some dynamical observables. Maybe we know something about the local diffusivity, something else. So what we can do is to take the stationary probability and back calculate the rate constant. This will be a matrix, and I'm glossing over the details here. This will be a matrix of rates. We can diagonalize this matrix and get the spectral gap. So, so this is the full algorithm that we are using in this method. We, we have the RAVE method, which gives us some candidate reaction coordinates. You might trust them, you might not trust them, because as I mentioned, some of them will be spurious due to AI misleading us. We can, however, build a maximum caliber-based dynamical model on these coordinates and pick the one with the maximum spectral gap and use that in the next round of RAVE. So that's how this algorithm works. As, uh, yeah. And as you can see, it does a better job of uh, distinguishing between uh, good and bad coordinates. The second method, which I'm going to show very quickly, and then I want to move to applications because I don't have a lot of time left, is this LSTN, which I mentioned is something we all use very, very heavily. So what I showed you was information bottleneck or autoencoder. There was one interesting thing about them. They took an input, they generated an output. They did not pass the output back into the input. Recurrent neural networks do exactly that. So they look something like this. They have an input, they generate some, something, and that is passed into the neural network again. And you have a loop here. There's a recurrent structure. And this recurrent structure is very useful for fitting time series. So recurrent neural network showed up, I think, 20, 30 years ago. They were quite early on, like many things in AI. If you go and read the literature, you will find that many of the giants in the field, some of them who are in the audience today, had done many things related to this back in the day. It's the advent of GPUs and all, which has really revived the field. They are very hard to train. So, and one of the problems there is that it becomes very hard to remember things that happened way far in the past. It's called the vanishing gradient problem. Long short-term memory network introduced a more complicated architecture and allowed allow people to remember information from even very back in the past. Even these can be hard to train. At Maryland, we have a lot of work going on on something called reservoir computing, which make these even easier to train. So, but this is the general family. So in this part of the talk, I'm not showing you how to predict dynamics, but I will show you how can we learn dynamics. And in this paper, one of the interesting things we found is that the reason why these long short so long short term memory networks might work for us is that if you go and look at the loss function that is being optimized over here, just like in an autoencoder, the loss function is similar to BLX information bottleneck. Here, the loss function is very similar to Kendall's caliber or the path entropy. So that was so when you're training, anytime you're typing in your, e in your email and trying to fill in words, the software that you're using, the algorithm that you're using is trying to come up with a model that learns your path entropy as closely as possible. And that's our interpretation for why these work well. And this opened up lots of interesting possibilities now that we have this understanding. So here, there's a bunch of, uh, 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 my student is very detail oriented, which is, a, I think, a very good trait in a PhD student. So he worked very, very, uh, hard on this on a range of model systems of an increasing complexity and showed how well it does. This one is more interesting. This is a riboswitch pulling experiment that we got from Michael Woodside. 
And this is an actual extension data generated by Michael. And uh, we discretized it, remember? So we are mapping it into a set of uh, words or characters. So this is the data that you generate from actually pulling the ribose switch. And this is what the LSTM generates. This is an experiment. This is very hard to do. And this is just like LSTM run on a single GPU once it has been trained. And we can get populations for the different states involved in this ribose switch quite accurately. And our referee made us compare to hidden Markov models. We found that hidden Markov models also do quite well, but they don't really capture fast time scale processes. So long story short here, we found that the LSTMs are way more accurate than the hidden Markov model across time scales without much uh, parameter fitting, which was very interesting. And uh, uh, final application I'm going to show before going to summary is again RiboSwitch, but this time using RAVE algorithm. Here, our collaborator at NCI, Jay Schneekloth, is trying to design synthetic ligands that can bind to the RiboSwitch. And uh, as I mentioned, if you just do long MD on it, nothing happens, the system just stays there. The good thing though is the flexibility profile that we get from MD is very similar to the so-called shape measurements done at NCI, which shows that the force field is not utterly garbage. Uh, but now we can run RAVE on this. So we are iterating between AI and molecular dynamics, and we can generate trajectories for how the system dissociates. For both systems, we find at least two pathways for dissociation. On the basis of these, we can make predictions about which mutations in the ribo switch will flip the strengths between the cognate and the synthetic. So currently, Jay, what he found that the synthetic ligand is a weaker binder than the cognate ligand. Now we are able to predict as to which mutations will flip this relative strength. And Jay is gonna verify our predictions. So that should be very exciting. And we have a bunch of more applications this one's done by Shashank, where this is explicit all atom folding of GB1 and water. He also put a nice Bollywood mu music soundtrack in it, which I cannot play for you right now. But again, we can generate the full free energy landscape for this. And then this paper just got accepted in a Journal of Physical Chemistry B, where we go and explain this, this trend that I showed you. And uh, yeah, and so we have many more applications. I'm gonna skip those. I'm just gonna go back to, to the summary slide, which I showed you in the interest of time at the very beginning. So the conclusion is AI can learn with things such as LSTM or even variation autoencoders trained on very long trajectories. You can learn what you've showed it. That's not a big problem. Predicting is harder, but we are making progress. A big part of the problem, it's not very smart. You have to figure out what is to be learned. It's, it needs a bit of hand tuning. Coupling with StackMech is what we find exciting and also a way to improve AI. And I glossed through some applications, but we have quite a few. You can go and look up our GitHub code for uh, our GitHub page for codes and examples and everything. And I think we have barely scratched the tip of the iceberg in terms of related to this very smart problem as to how much intuition do we have to give to AI in order for it to work. With that, thank you very much for your attention. I will be very happy to take questions. Great, thanks Pratyush for a really interesting talk. So we have a question. Um, I would like to encourage in the spirit of this meeting and the seminar series students to ask questions. Um, so we do have a question from Raphael. Are you a student? Uh, but I'll, I'll ask it. What was the noise in MD simulation which you forgot and learned the features for establishing RAVE? Uh, are characteristics of that noise known? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So let's see if I can find, because I did not go into the slide for this. Uh, is my slide again visible? Uh, sorry, yeah, yes, so. yeah. Okay, great. So here it's for alanine dipeptide. So an alanine dipeptide, we give it four dihedrals and we try to ask it which one is noise, which one is not. And it tells us that the green one, which is cosine of psi, this dihedral angle captures the important thing. Most of the other stuff is noise. That's an example. Here I am showing you these weights as a function of predictive delay, which is how far into the future you're trying to predict. And it's interesting is that it does not make much of a difference as to what choice you take for this parameter. This is a more practical problem, the dissociation of the small ligand benzene from T4 lysozyme. Here, this noise versus signal changes completely if you 
change this parameter of what, how far into the future you're trying to predict. If you're just trying to capture the system at delta t is equal to zero, which is just clustering, it seems like in this case, the highest weight is this due to this green thing, which is distance between one of the benzene, heavy benzene center of mass and one of the T4 lysozyme atoms. But if you go slightly into the future, you figure out that actually a big part of the reaction coordinate is a helix helix breathing movement. And so I hope that gives you intuition into what's going on. So we don't, we don't feed in what's the noise, what's the signal. This is something we expect to learn out of the algorithm. This could be done because we used a linear encoder here. For nonlinear encoders, this interpretation becomes harder, but it's not intractable. So hopefully that answers your question. There's a, um, Ching Chen has raised his hand and then maybe we go to Garrigan yeah. next. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk, it's very interesting. So I have uh, two questions. And mm -hmm. the first question I think is already partially like, uh, answered by you. So I, I have a question about the choice of this delta t is a delay and how to decide this uh, delay for your for your RIF algorithm. It looks like uh, I should choose the delta t at place where it could plateau. Yeah, am I correct? <laughs> it's a very good question. So my uh, student, Yehang, has a full paper on this. I encourage you to read this. I know I'm sounding highly academic by saying go read my paper. But we have a paper which is called Understanding the Role of the Time Delay in RAVE, where we show that the algorithm is not very sensitive to the exact choice. Now, what that method proves, show, what that paper shows, and it's quite uh, new, uh, analytical, what it shows is that as long as delta t is large enough without being too large, it will work. So that's kind of hard to see in experiments, but I'm uh, sorry, in computational things, because you, you might not get such a clean plateau. So what it tells you is that if you get a first plateau, where you land in that plateau does not really matter. But if you go too long, it won't work. In practice, what we do, we take it a few times slower than the, since we are doing a thermostatic molecular dynamic simulation. So we have a time constant for coupling with the bath. We take a few time steps slower than that. I see, thanks. Uh, a second question. Uh, I was wondering like uh, for the latent space, the, the dimension in the latent space, especially for the finding simulation, do you observe any conserved pattern? Because I was imagining like uh, what these uh, low dimensional dynamics would be looking like for a binding simulation. And when you like perturb the system, such as uh, mutating the uh, sequence, will this uh, low dimensional pattern still being conserved? So that's also a very good question. So I will, my, my answer is this. If you make your decoder complex enough, you can fit any complicated dynamics into a 1D latent variable. And that's dangerous because it will kind of show you that the problem is just one dimensional, but that's not true. Proteins are not really one dimensional. Maybe in some abstract space they are, but are they really? So figuring out, interpreting the latent variable is both its dimension and what it's telling you and how it is changing with respect to mutations and things like that is tricky, especially if you start using a non-linear encoder. That's why we have tried to stay with linear encoder, but anything beyond that, and that's what we will really need to do to answer your question, it's a work in progress, but it's, it's complicated. And lots of good theoretical questions that happen there as to how do we interpret, how do we say that we have just not compressed everything into a very non, so the problem with nonlinear dimensional reduction, it might, it, is that it might do the job too well, right? It might do the job so well that you stop being, it stops being useful. So we have a trade-off between, same like the information bottleneck. And uh, yeah, so my long story short, the answer is technical. We are working on it in how to compare the latent variable from system to system. For linear encoders, we can do it. For nonlinear, we have to think more. Thank you. All right, Garrick. You're muted, Garrick. I was saying really enjoyed your talk, Pratush. Um, I have a question about that second part of your talk when you had this long-term, uh, short-term memory model. Uh -huh. And usually when I s see it applied, it's, as you said, it's usually applied to 1D sequences. It could be either text 
which is a 1D sequence, or it could be, as also you said, like a market, uh, uh, stock market data, which is time. But in your case, it seems that you have two sequences. One is time if you are doing dynamics, but if you have multiple diagonal angles, it's like another dimension. And I know that there is an extension of it when you can combine LTSM with fully connected models, but I've seen, I haven't seen much applications of it, like th those kind of things that are not really one dimensional. And yeah. I'm wondering, what do you think about all that? Yeah, so now I know for a fact that Garrick was paying attention. That's very good. <laughs> Garrick was not using LSTM on his phone to send emails. <laughs> so no, that's a good point. So here, even for the, even for the rival switch, which is very high dimensional system, right? The LSTM is trained only on the extension. It is fed only a 1D variable. It might sound like cheating, but the reason this works is because there, there are two reasons it works. So first of all, this, ex, ex, this extension variable, if you wrote down a generalized Ronge 1 equation to describe this extension variable, it will have a very long memory kernel, right? It's not Markovian, anything like that. But that's the thing about LSTM. It can capture the non markovianity Secondly, if you don't know what is an extension and you're working on actual MD data, which we haven't done here yet, this is on experiments, we did it for the model systems, but not on complicated things. This 1D variable that we feed into LSTM could be the output of RAVE. So RAVE could generate our latent variables and then we could fit a time series to that using LSTM. We have, I think we have tried to do it on two dimensional words, whatever that means, or maybe even three dimensional words, the training cost explodes. Mm -hmm. So we try to stay as close to 1D as we can for the LSTM and uh, just take records in the belief that, uh, records in the observation that even if this 1D variable is a really crappy reaction coordinate, LSTM is reaction coordinate free. It will still capture the long time kernel. So I hope that answers the question to some extent. Mm -hmm. at least. Great, thanks. Are there any other last quick questions? Otherwise, um, any I had a questions? question to yeah. ask. So, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So, uh, okay. I wanted to know in the context of LSTM, as far as I understand, LSTM is used in the context when there's a memory effect in the system. Like it tries to understand what happened sometime before. So, in the context of uh, these simulations, why do I need to like worry about the effects of memory here? Oh. You totally need to because this extension is a highly non Markovian variable. So let's look at this blue plot in the middle. And uh, do you see my cursor moving? Yes. So let's say my cursor right now is at extension 705. Okay. And let's say I, that's all I told you. Would you be able to tell me whether it is coming from the unfolded ribo switch or the folded ribo switch? You won't, right? Because the 705 could very well be in this domain or it could be in the bottom domain. The only way to answer this is to go and look at the past of the extension and see where it came from. So that was the whole point. So you are absolutely correct that LSTMs don't need to worry about, we don't need to worry about memory if you have a perfect reaction coordinate because that's the thing, you know, it, it, you don't need to carry information about the past. Knowing where you are or a few time steps into the past is sufficient to tell you everything. But here we are using it for variables which are highly non-Markovian and you really need to know how you got there. In fact, you need to know the path for a long time into the past and that, that's where the memory effect comes in. So, uh, so the, it's better than the generalized Langevin uh, perspective? So no, it's not you... better. It's not better. So there is a paper by Wienan at Princeton where he shows that they're kind of equivalent. Generalized Langevin equation is a very elegant framework of understanding things. LSTM is a framework of doing things. You might argue that GLE is also a way of doing things. And I might argue that LSTM is also a way of understanding things. But here we are just using it as one approach to do it. I won't compare it to GLE because there you have to fit the memory kernel and things like that, right? We are not trying to do anything like that. But people have tried to extract the memory kernel for GLE out of LSTM. I don't think there has been much success. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we are a fair bit over time. Yeah. So I think yeah. if that is all the questions we have, we should go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for being here at the seminar today. We'll have the next one the last Wednesday of September. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs>
Yeah. Thanks. So, hope everybody Fine. joins the next time too. Well, okay. Well, I'll see you. Thanks for the Maryland people. They're all here on the app. Bye bye then. <laughs> bye bye. Actually, there's not, I don't know, I don't recognize that many from Maryland. It's from all over. It's a good group today. Yeah, yeah. So, that was good. Great. Um, thanks, Margie. Yeah, thank y'all. Yeah, bye. Thanks.